In the previous video that I did, a lot of people wanted to know who was it that I met with that really laid out this plan that had me decide to go ahead and pull the trigger by this place. And it was uh, one of my buddies, Tucker Max. And I sat down with him to go through an interview process and find out exactly what he's seen, the way he's thinking through it, um, and how things have changed in his own mind and why you might need to do the same. So let's go. Going back to that, uh, the expert versus knower, I, I heard uh, Dennis Prager, he talked about like, mm -hmm. I wanna have, I'm okay having influence, right. I don't wanna have control. Totally. Right. So control is like maybe the teacher. Right. Like, no, don't do it. Do it this way. Do it well, this definitely way. the modern the, the the modern American Western public school system is designed with the, like that in mind. Like that's uh, I mean that's not really a debatable fact. The entire public school system is structured to create to to take free thinking children and tell them to uh, they teach them how to obey orders to stay in one place that the answers come from the front, that the teacher is the expert, and their job is to memorize what they're told, right? That work, that's great. If you're trying to create factory workers or obedient servants, that's a fantastic system. If you're trying to create happy, sovereign, creative individuals, not a good system, right? right? And so the word teacher in, in the Western world, to me, it kind of implies the old system, right? Whereas if I'm sharing my knowledge, my experiences, I'm just, like if you notice, I've said, we, we were walking around your ranch and I kept saying, well, I, in my experience, right. goats are X. In my experience, sheep are Y. I'm not telling you what goats and sheep are, right? I'm telling you what my experience with them is, which is, I can know that for a fact. That's my experience. And you could have had a totally different experience or you could be like, oh wow, that's super interesting. I didn't see that angle. I'm gonna take that experience and, and apply it to my experience, see if it works or not, right? Which takes that whole, those who can do, those who can't teach, <laughs> and turns that upside down because mm -hmm. we have a bunch of professors that are teaching you things they've yeah. never been able to do. Yes, yes. Right? Or just not teaching you either nonsense or things they haven't done, right. or things they've heard about other people doing. Yeah, most, I mean, that's the hard reality. Like, yeah. mo it's why I love the Waldorf system. It's why the school we created in Dripping is Waldorf because it's not teachers uh, telling kids what to do or what to think. It's teachers helping children learn to explore themselves yeah. and find their own answers, yeah. right? Which is, that is the best teacher is the one who, who is the guide uh, and, and, and uh, the shepherd but not the, the, the expert or the control uh, you know, the person trying to be in control, right? Which is antithetical to most of the way the West works right now, unfortunately. So then what, what role does the expert have? It depends on how you're using the term expert, but to me... Well, the you, old, you just use the word expert. So if, you, if we're talking about like the way that, that the corporate media uses the term expert, what they really mean is this is a person who has the right opinion, and so I want you to adopt their opinion, right? But like... Okay, so right now, my ma the main things I do are rancher and shepherd, or rancher and shepherd, um, and like the people I consider the only people I listen to are people who have done what I'm trying to do. The right? ten thousand hours, right? Like, if I want to, if I need to to make a decision about my sheep, uh, or what to do, or whatever, I go to people like my fence guy who's putting up fence today. Uh, this dude has put up. God, who knows, thousands of miles of fence for sheep and cows and goats. And so when I, when I ask him a question about sheep for fence, I listen to the dude because he puts up fence for sheep and he's done it so much he knows what works and what doesn't. Yeah. That's an expert. He's done it. Right? You, told me, you told me about the pond that I should probably find someone who digs a pond because it's not easy to dig a pond right. in Texas. Right, and I don't know. Yeah. I've never dug a pond. Yeah. I've never, I don't know, right? So yeah. I'm like, go talk to the people who've done it multiple times and have failures and successes they learn from other people that that's why living on land and, and starting a business and all this sort of stuff is so cool because it forces you to uh, to uh, uh, gauge your opinions against reality right yeah. like I can have opinions about sheep but the sheep have a say yeah right whereas the way the corporate media puts it is like well this ep ep epidemiologist who came up with this math model that they pulled out of their ass is the expert and we have to do what they say. Why? And, and that's a big piece that uh, have to do what they say. So like, um, 
growing up racing dirt bikes, I've broken all my bones. Uh, one time when I was building this house, I had this inspection in the morning and I right. could not, it would delay my project months. It would cost right. me tens of thousands of dollars. I broke my leg, I'm in the hospital and I'm like, I gotta be at the job site in the morning. The doctor's like, no way, are you kidding me? Your leg's freaking broken. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. And I had to weigh yeah. the worst that could happen with what happens if I don't go. Yeah. And I had to make the decision. Yeah. So I got the expert opinion yes. and then allowed me to make the decision. Right. It's when the expert is now, I'm forced to take the experts because he doesn't know all the pros and cons that no. were involved in my no. life. And it's not up to him to make that decision. It's your life. And if you want to take on the risk, take on the risk, yeah. right? No problem with that, totally. I'll, even in that case, I'd hesitate to call doctor. It depends on the doctor. Most doctors are not experts on health, truly. Like, well, not they, health. No, tr they, uh, I don't. I think there's one med school in America that teach that even has a class on nutrition. None of them teach about sleep. None of them teach. They teach almost nothing about emotional health. They're not experts on health. Right. Uh, American Western American medical care is what's called allopathic care, and it is a sick care model. It yeah. is based on treating acute uh, issues and usually treating them directly, yeah. treating symptoms, not causes, right? right? Whereas like, you know, uh, th there are other models, chiropractics, osteopaths, nursing, nursing is its own separate model that is a whole, it's like a the root cause model, yeah. right? They have a whole different approach. Most doctors are not, if I get in a car wreck, right? And I have a lot of physical trauma, like you said, your wife's an ER doctor, right? My, my sister. Okay. Sister, I'm gonna listen to your sister. Like she's probably an expert on treating trauma. physical, like t trauma to the body, I'm totally gonna listen to her. She's probably treated hundreds of car wreck patients, sewed them up, whatever. That's when I'm gonna listen, right? When a doctor says, here's how you get healthy, mm, yeah. I'm probably not gonna listen because right. they probably don't know what the hell they're talking about. And to your point, I told you she left California and joined a uh, functional medicine clinic in Houston. Right. And she said, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> right. They're having to teach me everything. Yeah. Yeah. So she admitted it, right? Yeah. So Good for her. Good yeah. For her. She came out of medical school like this yeah. and told our whole family, yeah. and my parents raised us pretty healthy, yeah. and so we've kind of thought about that, but she came home, nope, forget the vitamins, forget eating healthy, all you need is pharmaceuticals. And like, she came home like that, and it took her a long time to, right. to get To, to get unpack the bullshit. To yeah. unpack it, yeah. Uh -huh. So um, we've had a great talk so far, yeah. talking for a couple hours. We covered a lot of ground that I want to come back to. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to go back and revisit the Doomer Optimism, mm -hmm. which um, you wrote that as an article, which December got, 28th. December 28th. It's only, what is, that's like three months ago. God, it feels you, like a year ago. I feel like it was the exact mm -hmm. talk you gave me in April November. Yeah. You probably practiced. Yeah, when we had that mastermind with Jesse. When we had that's the mastermind right. with that's Jesse. Right. So you delivered that talk, and yeah. then I feel like the Doomer Optimism was the same talk. Yeah. So I want to revisit that, and then maybe what's totally. changed in yeah. that in the last three to four months. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to talk about this uh, war on information. Uh -huh. You wrote I books. I call it a mimetic war, but same shit. Yeah. Because you've written books mm -hmm. and you started a book writing company, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call that, yeah. uh, you're in this information dissemination, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. I call it a, a war of information. We spent a lot of time talking about Ukraine yeah. and China and the information going out and all that. Um, so first off, I've said that I think the next war would be a war of information and mm -hmm. money. Yes. I think we're in a war of information and money. 100%. I said we got the memes and we got the Bitcoin, so we'll right. win. But usually it's not a war of information, it's a mimetic war. So right. I, I wanted to ask you what that part okay. meant. So a war of information to me, apply, we may be saying the same thing, just using different words. A war of information implies like a war over facts. Like whoever gets the right information and the right facts wins. That would be cool if that was true, right? If it was just a battle over figuring out what, what truth. the truth is, That'd be awesome, but that's not, I don't think that's at all what's going on. Uh, um, I call it a mimetic war because most people, the way the human brain works, they don't look at facts and then make an, a, a determination or an opinion or an analysis off of facts. They begin with their, their opinion already, right? And then they fit the facts to their opinion, right? That's the, roughly speaking, that's the way humans, that's almost all humans think that way. It is exceedingly rare to find someone who actually, first off, who will change their mind based on facts alone, that's almost unheard of, right? And then, but then also someone who objectively from their own 
a, a viewpoint, look at facts, and then make their own determinations you, off you of those You think facts. that's rare in humans, or is that, a sub, is that, is that where we're at today? It's as, extremely rare in humans. So it's not because today we're all short-term thinkers, we want to read headlines, that's just humans overall. I think, that's, I think that system evolved just off of who we are. Okay. That system evolved because it works on most people. Okay. The reality is that m maybe in a different world it would have been different, I don't know. But I think the reality is the vast majority of people understand reality through uh, their social group and through their self-determined or assigned identities. Right. Right. I'm not saying that's good uh, or better. That's just the way people are. Be How many times a day do you hear people say, as a woman, as a Democrat, as a Republican, as a Texan, I think whatever? Right. You're not thinking then. If you say, as a Texan, I believe, then you are not thinking, you are allowing your beliefs to be assigned to you by a group, right? Uh, so I call it a mimetic war because I think what's happening, the frame, in, in essence, to sum up what I, what I was saying, the frame upon which the information sets is really what wins the debate. That's what wins the war, right? It's, is that it, like a narrative? Yeah, exactly. A, a, a narrative is another name for frame. So if, if, you, if you get to be in charge of all the information and facts, but I get to be in charge of the lens people see them through, I'm going to win every single right. time. Every single fucking time, without exception. And so I think what's going on now is not a war of facts, but a war of frames, a war of narratives, right? Which is the, the, the more precise term for that is a mimetic war, because it is a war of ideas. Whereas... It, is, that, you, is that mimetic from meme, like a meme? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Totally. Hundred percent. Like a meme is just a, essentially a particle of thought, the way a gene is a particle of right. genetic code, right? And so, the, uh, uh, if you can control how people see facts, I mean, like, how many? It's still. I thought I understood this pre-COVID, man, and it was way worse than I ever thought. It blows my mind how people can look at the same facts I do. On both sides. Right. You can have hard right QAnon lunatics and they'll look at the facts I look at and come up with conclusions and I'm like, none of these make sense. They're just what your group tells you to think. And then you go the other side with you know the woke uh, social justice lunatics or whatever variations are. And the same thing. I'm like, you guys are looking at people burn property down and you're saying this is okay? Because Mostly peaceful. Like, <laughs> look at yourselves. Yeah. Like you would... And you just see, and then both groups are, you know, like, you're the hypocrite, you're the hypocrite. I'm like, ugh. That's why I call it a mimetic war is because most people are only thinking from the frame of as a blank. As this identity, as this part social group, I have to believe this thing. That's right? um, a, like a paradigm. Totally. Right? No, so we another can, name for it. We can both see the same thing, but see different outcomes. Well, you can see the same facts. The same see facts. them in different. We're seeing it right now. Yeah, Literally yeah. yesterday... Uh, Roe v. Wade was supposedly you know, the, the the leak of the, uh, the the decision on Roe v. Wade came out, and like the same set of facts, the, the facts are unarguable in Roe versus Wade, and uh, most Democrats are freaking out, and most Republicans are super happy. The funny thing is, let's say Roe v. Wade is overturned, it doesn't actually change one abortion law in this country, not one, because all that all Roe v. Wade says is the federal government. Can uh, 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 laws supersede the states in abortion? If Roe v. Wade is overturned, not one abortion law changes, but it, you know, it does go to states, right? And states may decide to change their laws. Yeah, so will, will states change laws? I'm sure. Of course that's going to happen. Right. All it means is that like, uh, 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 the decision-making apparatus now goes local, right? Okay, fine. That, Which most of us would be in favor of. I, that's the funny part is that like all these people, all these people, like you, watching the contradictions with both sides is hilarious. So like all, all these people who were super in, char in, in, in favor of forced mandates, forced vaccinations, are now my body, my choice. And it, right. How does that work? It, it, <laughs> but then on the other side, all these, you know, like uh, uh, Republicans who are like states' rights, whatever, Right? Don't believe in, uh, uh, like, they, they were, uh, uh, they're super against, uh, um, uh, like, all the different, um, uh, 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 all the different uh, abortion laws and all the different other stuff. So it's like, guys, you can't have it both ways. Or the iconic one is that all the pro-choice people are anti-death um, penalty and all the pro-death penalty people are pro-life and it's like, 
the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. That doesn't that make none of because they're both thinking from identity, right? They're both thinking from group. And they see? both th they they also both think about what they want personally, probably. No. No? No. I think they're they're all taking if you're a Democrat, you have your beliefs assigned to you. If you're a Republican, you have your beliefs because assigned have to you. Because uh, I have to believe whatever that party believes yes. to. Right, to stay in that group, right? That, and and we, talk, we were talking about this earlier before we were recording, about the hypocrisy of both groups is, right. is a feature, not a bug, right? right? If, if, if you're forced to believe nonsense, patently obvious nonsense to stay in a group, that's, that actually solidifies, for most people, it solidifies your membership in the group. Right now, as we saw with COVID, like everyone has a degree to which they, or a place at which they, almost everyone, a place at which they wake up. There were a ton of people in Mar May of 2020 who were like, you know, marching the, banging the drum for masks and and this and that. By May of 2021, we're like, hold on, this is fucked up. Yeah. And then by now, are like super anti everything that happened. Right. So uh, people can and do wake up at times. Yeah. Right. Uh, but. But the, it's a mimetic war because it is a battle. The main battle I see is to try, uh, people are trying to get you in their group so you think the way they think, follow what yeah. they follow. Right? Which is the identity politics. Bitcoin's the same way. Bitcoin's a, it's a mimetic group, right? Yeah, I think, uh, so one, I would say uh, thinking is a lot of work. That's not an insult. I don't mean that as an insult. And yeah. part, part, of the, no, yeah, for sure. part of the Bitcoin mimetic structure is to be disagreeable and to challenge orthodoxy, right? Which makes it sort of this weirdly robust and free thinking group, you know? Do you, but, do you think it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg? This is something we talk about a lot, right? right? So like, are people that are naturally free thinking find Bitcoin? Or are people that come into Bitcoin are then turned into more natural? Because if you look at the Bitcoin, if, if you look at Bitcoiners as a subset, right. they're carnivores, they're savers. They're working on ranching. They're working on health. They're working on school pods. Right. So is the people that are naturally drawn to those then say, well, I, I want to change school, health, education, and money? Or is it they come into Bitcoin and then go, well, shoot, now that I've changed money, maybe I should go change all these other things? So I, I, like, I, would, I would bet at the beginning it's mainly people who were free thinkers, at least around money and, and, and energy and, 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 and finance, right? Um, and then what ended up happening, I think, is that because of a lot of who the early Bitcoiners were and the public ones, people like you, you know, who came in and talked a lot and yeah. became influential in the space, I think they tended to be people who focused a lot on sovereignty. And if you're focusing on, if you're free thinking, you're focusing on sovereignty at this point in the world, that means you are pro meat. That means, because you understand that makes you healthy. You understand your body is a place you have to, you understand a whole bunch of things. So a lot of those things became social, but the thing I've seen, at least in the Bitcoin groups that I've uh, interacted with or whatever, is that like, they'll be the random weirdo vegan, sure. right? And and the other Bitcoiners, like, hey, I tease them a little, but they're like, okay, cool. Like yeah. if, you, if you see the same thing we see about money, I can accept everything because else. Because we prioritize freedom. Right. Like, as long as you don't have any Solana in your wallet, <laughs> yeah. then you're welcome here, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, they have one or two things that are, like, non-negotiables, right? Right. But everything else is, like, okay, cool. Yeah. Because they tend to be, it's, t I, I have not met the person who's super into Bitcoin, but is also trying to control other people. Right. You know, like, those, that person might exist. I just don't yeah. accept well, the crypto space is yeah. the only thing they're trying to control, yeah. right? Because it's pro-freedom. So it's like, hey, free, free, to, free to do you. But back to this mimetic war, this narrative war, if you will, then um, interesting enough, Klaus Schwab, World, right. World Economic Forum, wrote the COVID-19 Great Reset. Of course. And now wrote a no, new book, The right. Great Narrative. Uh -huh. And so trying to control that narrative. One thing that I've seen, and this is why I call it, call it the war of information, whatever right. you want to call it, but it's the narrative that's been being lost. And so like... Whatever you want to call that side. I don't like labels for exactly the reason you're talking about. Yeah. Am I a libertarian or Republican yeah. or conservative? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm none of that. No. Uh, I, I, might, I might agree with a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, but like uh, they've, whoever 
the globalists, we'll call them that. Right. I, don't, I don't like to use the word elite. They're not elite at anything. The globalists, they have this agenda, and they've been able to control media, right? right? Control money, Corporate all these things. Media, yes. Corporate media, mainstream yeah. media. But yeah. now we've had this alternative media that's mm -hmm. been blowing up. So the Joe Rogans, uh, the Tucker Carlsons, they're just blowing up, and they've lost the narrative, back to that narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is a, also part of what's really sped up uh, maybe this, uh, the last two years where they've had to like, oh shoot, we're losing, let's grab on. Yeah. We gotta course, go faster. We gotta, we gotta go run faster. our plan faster. Yeah. Which is gonna make it break. And they've shown their hand. Yes. And then yeah. you were talking earlier about like the pot that you're trying to keep the lid on a boiling pot. Yeah, that's what trying to, yeah. But it's not gonna, it doesn't work. Which then makes them squeeze even harder, mm -hmm. which then makes people push back even harder and it starts to escalate that situation. 100% what's going on. Yeah. So as somebody who's been an author, mm -hmm and wrote a publishing, or you have a publishing business or whatever you call that, um, Scribe Media, mm -hmm. um, you've been either responsible for putting out your own information, helping people put out their own information. I mean, mm -hmm. do you see that as a, a very valuable skill, a very valuable tool that we have today to kind of push back against that? Yeah, I'm, yes. Um, all right, so it, this is, we talked about this a little bit too. This is the thing that I've really shifted the most about over the last six months or a year, right? Uh, up to, and you can look in my social media timeline, you can see the shift in me. But like up until about six months or a year ago, I was, for me, very engaged in fighting the, the dominant narrative, right? Um, because it's all bullshit. All the COVID narrative, all that, like the dominant narrative. And now everyone's like, oh shit, it was. But like, when, uh, when I was talking about it and a lot of other people like you, like it wasn't, and, and I was very focused on that for a while. And then I realized that um, even, if I'm, even if I'm fighting something, to fight something is to give it energy. Right. And to engage in it and give it energy, right? Exactly. And, and so what I realized was, even if I hated whatever you want to call it, the globalist narrative, however it's defined, fighting it gave it power. And that if I really actually wanted to fight it, well, first off, I, what I realized is I didn't actually care about fighting it. I really cared about living my life the way I wanted to live my life, right? And that uh, I could just start doing, I didn't have to defeat the globalists to do that. I just needed to go do that. Exactly. And so my wife and I bought a ranch in Dripping Springs, right? Very close to you. Um, uh, and then we, uh, that's where our focus is now. We started our own school. Us and some other families started our own Waldorf out near the ranch uh, in Dripping. We, um, you know, cows, sheep, uh, uh, chickens, bees, like we built like um, a, a, a ranch and a farm essentially. And like we've really started to build, first we got food, water, land sovereign, and as possible. We're still in America, I pay taxes, like I'm not a lunatic about that stuff, at least not yet. Um, but like, uh, and then started really focusing on building community, right? And that's what we've been focused on. And uh, like I was talking about, like I don't pretend like, oh, what's happening in the Ukraine or with COVID or whatever has zero impact on me. Of course it's gonna have some impact, but if I really, really want to insulate myself from that. The best way to do it is to build the world I want to live in and then tr uh, uh, try and attract as many other people who are thinking and feeling in a similar way uh, to either be around me or be with me to be in a community, right? So one of the quotes that I use a lot, I love, is Socrates said, focus all your energy, the word you just used, focus all your energy not on fighting the old, but on building, building the, new, the new, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of exactly what you're talking about. And so the way I think about my information is not to attack or discredit their ideas, right. but give power to new ideas. Yes. Right? That's why I call it a mimetic war. Because if, if you try and battle in the realm of information, you lose the frame, right? Like, only, but, only if we can overcome it with better information, though, maybe. I don't, better information changes almost no one's mind. But a better frame does. Okay. So for example, like, let me, I'll, just, I'll give you a hard example. So, I could all day, I could spend, and there are people who do, spend all day long detailing the horrors of the American educational system. Chris Rufo does this actually, and he's really good at it. He details uh, how the infiltration of Marxism and CRT into American public schools and, and all the, 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 the weird, perverse, trans bullshit and all that other stuff, right? 
and and oh, it's a horrible. Normalizing it's pedophilia. Horrible. And all that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's so horrific. I could, and I'm not in any way shitting on Chris. I'm glad he's doing that work. It is extremely beneficial to a lot of people. Um, but I don't want to do that, right? Uh, instead, I'm just going to go build my own school. But do you think it is beneficial for some people to do that? Like we need people doing all kinds of things? Yeah, maybe. Like uh, that, that's what I'm saying. Like I'm not like because uh, this isn't because about who's doing better or worse. Yeah. Like it, it, there. If but, there are a bunch of people stuck in public school, if this, if that, then and that's how they want to change their world. Okay, cool. Like, I, who am I to judge them? Yeah, yeah. Like that. In no way, say, shape, or form, am I saying they're doing it wrong? Yeah. No, 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 no. I don't mean that at all. But um, for me, uh, I have the resources and the ability to start my own, to get with like-minded people who have all, uh, also have resources to start their own school. So I'm gonna do that, yeah. right? And, and it's, not, it's not a comment on what Chris and everyone else is doing. Like, I support them. Like, I, I give money to him. I'm happy for them that they're, they're fighting the good fight, right? But they're fighting the informational fight. They may win or may not, right? But what I know I'm gonna win. I know that when my kids show up at that, at that new Waldorf, I know who the headmaster is because he stayed at my house for nine days. I, I, I know his wife. I know how he thinks. I know the battles he's fought. I know that man is, sh is showing up to teach my children for the same reason that I'm, uh, with the same principles and values that I'm raising them. I know we're going to be good. And then what that is, man, is, again, not better or worse. I, I did a, a, what I thought was a throwaway post about that. Saturday, last Saturday morning, like no one's on social Saturday at 8.30 a.m. I put up a post with a picture of like the, the classrooms that they're, they're being built. And I just said, hey, listen, uh, you know, like we're building a school. Like I couldn't find a school that I thought was healthy and safe. And so we're building one and then blah, blah. And I didn't, I didn't put the name of the school. I didn't tell people it was a role. It wasn't about the school. I'm just like, everyone's looking for someone else to lead. And that's fine. But you can be that person. Like we did it. It's not. It's it's easier than you think. Simple throwaway post. True, right? Um, man, the response was overwhelming. Hundreds and hundreds of people were like offering to pay me to get yeah. on calls to tell them how to do this, yeah. right? And so, like, part of what I see is my mission and the thing I'm good at is I can set new frames, right? And show people this is not only possible. I don't mean in theory, like. Like, we can have great public schools. I mean, like, I am going to do this. This exists. We are doing it. And if I can do it, you yeah, do I'm it. smart, whatever. But you're just as smart as me, if not smarter. Yeah. Right? I got money. You got just as much money as me. And, and so are thousands of other people out there. Right? Maybe not everybody, but plenty can. Maybe hundreds of people reached out to you and said, we want to do the same thing because they saw Chris Rufo's posts telling them how bad things no, were. Maybe, right? Yeah. So like, it's why I'm not like, oh, I'm better. No, man, I love yeah. what he's doing and James Lindsay. They are waking people up to yeah. what is happening and that's awesome work. Yeah. Uh, it, I've, I've actually talked, I know James pretty well. He's been around my house for dinner. We talked about, it's like he's fighting a holding motion, right? Keeping the, the, the animals at bay while everyone else wakes up and starts building yeah. where we're all gonna go. Maybe you do need both, yeah. right? And, and I love those dudes. I'm super supportive of them. In a war, you have people at all different levels doing, doing all, all different, different things, things right? right? Yeah, it's true. In a memetic war, you got to have all different, just like in a regular war. But to me, what's, what I f I'm best at, and I think I just personally believe is most important, right? For me, at least, is building the world I want to live in, right? And, so, and then I'm going to share it to show people there are other ways to live. If they don't choose it, that's cool. If you want to go live in a failed blue state yeah. and have endless abortions and, and force your kids to transition at five, bless your heart. Right. Right? We're not going to do that. Right. Yeah. So focus all your energy on building the world that you want, which is what I talk about, which is one reason why I love Bitcoin, but I also see people come into Bitcoin back to kind of the earlier post. Once they come into Bitcoin, they start getting into all these different areas. Right. Without the freedom to transact payments, oh, yeah, totally. there's no freedom. I'm with you. Freedom of speech. But I have no phone to put that post on social media or no computer. I have freedom to assemble, but I can't pay to put gas totally. in my truck. 100%. So it unlocks that. And then it's like, well, shoot, now that I have freedom to transact, well, then I can set up a school and I can set up on those things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm definitely focused on building the new and um, trying to encourage, motivate, educate people on how to do the same. And leading by example, of course, is the best way to do that. I would rather not waste my energy on trying to fight the old either. But I, I think it is beneficial to have people 
telling people how bad, because I talk to people all the time, like, what's so wrong with schools? Because my kids don't go to school anymore. <laughs> right. They've been pulled out for a couple of years now. Yeah. Well, what's so, what's so bad with them? It's uh, like, yeah, no, they're horse you don't know? <laughs> Like, <laughs> it depends on the school district, yeah. but like there's horror stories. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so going back to being sovereign, right. and that, that's something that you're super focused on. So um, tell me what that means, I guess, first of all. Yeah, so th- uh, I used to, in my mind, I had sovereignty and freedom as um, nearly identical meanings as words. And as I've really grown and, uh, and uh, matured or developed or learned over the last two years, I think, especially, th- those are not the same thing. Um, uh, uh, to me, so- I focus on sovereignty and not freedom. Not that I don't like freedom. Like, freedom's great. But Can you um, have one without the other? They're different, yeah, but similar. Actually, yeah, I, 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 man, that... That is probably a deep epistemological rabbit hole to go into. Okay. I'm not sure. I don't. Okay. I, I'm not sure. But I'll tell you why. At a minimum, I focus on sovereignty over freedom. Okay. Because to me, freedom is a negotiation of what you can and cannot do in a system. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, for either, whether you're talking about freedom from or freedom to or freedom like all that sort of stuff, like negative or, or positive freedoms, those are all very important and big debates. But that's within a system. S- the question of sovereignty is who owns me, right? Yeah, f- the, the the question of freedom I- is important there, but sovereignty brings in uh, something that freedom does not have to bring in, which is responsibility, mm. right? It's like that's a good. The one. simplistic way I would explain it is sovereignty is freedom plus responsibility, right? But the key with sovereignty is uh, freely chosen responsibility, right? Like. I got, my wife didn't force me to marry her, right? She didn't force me to stay with her. We're together because we choose to, right? And we're free to leave anytime we want, right? Uh, that's sovereignty, right? Um, and, and I feel like we live in America, we live in a world of, you know, if you don't pay your taxes, men with guns show up and take your shit, right? So like, there is a level at which no human, I think, is probably truly sovereign in America, although there could be debates about that. but. Um, what I am working to do now is to build as much sovereignty as I can and to do it on as many levels as I can. And sovereignty does not mean complete individualism, living by myself off the grid. That might be complete freedom under certain definitions. That's not probably not sovereignty, right? Sovereignty to me includes responsibility and usually community. It, yeah, I guess it is possible to be a sovereign individual, sure, right? I, I'm not... But most a, a truly sovereign individual. I mean, that's a spectrum a that true, maybe won't ever be achieved. I would say honestly, you could make a good argument that a truly sovereign individual is a god, and that is not. I am not a god, right? right? So, uh, but a sovereign communities, absolutely, you can have. Absolutely, you can have. And in fact, the stronger the community, the usually the stronger your sovereignty, right? And and there are groups in America who are really good proof of that, like the Mormons. Right? The Mormons have always had this weird relationship with America. It's why they're the OG preppers. Right. Like every Mormon for forever has been a prepper. Why? Because what other religion had the US military come and try and exterminate them, right? right? They've, they've known for a long time. They are preppers. Those dudes are not necessarily on our side. Yeah. We've gotta be ready, uh, what's the, uh, in, in hiking, uh, we gotta be ready to self-rescue, Right. you know? And so, like, uh, I got a lot of Mormon friends that I didn't, there was a lot I didn't understand about them until the last two years. And I'm like, oh, now I get it. And they're like, see, I told you. Yeah. And so, um, I've been focusing on as much as possible. It's why we, so, our, our land has, we have our own well. We're putting in now rainwater capture, right? So, we're going to be water sovereign. We, well, I don't rely on anyone for water. Um, uh, we're going to be nearly energy, we're on the grid, but also have solar or whatever. We're going to be energy sovereign, right? Yeah, I don't want to be off uh, off the grid for food. I want like cool stuff, to, you know, come from all over the world. That's cool, you know. Like you can't make maple syrup in Texas. Right. You can't make goji berries in Texas, but at the same time, I am food sovereign. Like we have we have all the meat we need, and we have the ability to produce as much as we want. Right. We have the ability to grow whatever we need. So if things go sideways for certain periods of time, I'm not relying on some. I don't have to bend the knee to anyone right. else to survive. Right. Right? 
Now, like there's taxes, there's still other things, right? The complications, but um, over the last year, we've gone from not sovereign at all, living in a fucking, you know, a, a nice house, but it's a McMansion in the suburb. Yeah. No sovereignty, yeah. none. You think you do, but you're not. Yeah. Now I, we are. I think of sovereignty as being able to live my life as I see fit mm -hmm. that leads to my own ends, not yeah. to somebody else's. Yeah, totally. In, uh, the ends that I choose. The ends that totally. I choose. Totally, yes. F.A. Hayek, uh, his seminal book was uh, The Constitution of Liberty, mm -hmm. and he defines liberty as uh, freedom of coercion. Mm -hmm. So coercion would be like, uh, take the jab or lose your job. Mm -hmm. Either choice yes. leads you to their ends, yes. right? And so I want choices that lead me to my own ends. Um, you had said that uh, a year ago you were living in McMansion in the suburbs, mm -hmm. and now you've gone all the way over to being self-sovereign. Um, we'll talk more about that, but I want to go into this uh, piece that you wrote, this Doomer Optimism piece, mm -hmm. because November 2021, you and I and some other guys got together and had this little mastermind group, and you laid out a very compelling case as to uh, what you saw happening in the world, yeah. um, what you thought could happen potentially, and, and I think that was probably the catalyst for you to take this year journey yeah. to go here. Yeah. It also had me go the very next day yeah. and buy a ranch down the road from you. Yeah. So now here we are in Texas yeah. talking about this. Yeah. Um, so lay out the Doomer Optimism piece right. uh, for us and then we'll talk about maybe talk about that. Well, what's fun, so I, uh, you and I talked in November 21 and since then, all, like half of I what think I was, I think it was November 5th. Yeah, I don't anyway, remember the exact anyway, yeah. Like so, but uh, 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 Almost everything I wrote in the piece is like either already true or coming true. It's nuts and it's only been four or five months. Basically all I wrote, man, like it's on my website, but all I wrote was how, like how I, what someone might call red pill, I was already red pill a long time ago, but how I woke up to what was really going on in the world and realized, wait a minute, like the, it looks to me like there is a slow speed managed collapse coming. And that I don't know who exactly or why exactly, right? We can talk about World Economic Forum or this elite or China or that. I don't actually care about figuring out who's doing this. I don't care that much. Like it'll be interesting to know when if, if everything comes to light. I don't care. What I care about is knowing, it became very clear to me and I just posted all the things that helped me realize that like the institutions in America, to the extent that they were ever functional and ever cared about me, uh, are captured and broken and don't care anymore. And what that means is I need to get sovereign because I am now at the mercy of a system that that at best doesn't care, at worst is trying to destroy me, right? And so like- Doesn't care about your own personal well-being. Exactly, Okay. Right. doesn't care. Cares about me only as a- uh, Taxpayer. <laughs> as a unit, as a means to its own end. Right. You know, like it's a battery for it, right? And I'm like, that's not gonna work for me, right? And so, uh, all, and so and the idea of doomer optimism is that a lot of bad shit's coming. The shit's gonna really hit the fan, but if we do our work, things are gonna be okay, right? Like uh, I, I think we're going through, I mean, dude, like you've talked about cycles and stuff, like financial sure. cycles and debt cycles. It, wh however you study cycles, right? And there's a lot of different schools on cycles, but all of the schools are basically like, oh dude, all the cycles are coming to a head right now, like in yeah. the next decade. All the different They're ones, all right? Yeah. The social cycles, the war cycles, the debt cycles. So there's going to be a shit ton of chaos right. in the next decade, right? So the question really is, what the hell are you going to do? And so I wrote about like the five sort of places that I really was going to focus, which is defense, water, food, um, energy, and, and community, right? Those are, and community really is the most important, but I kind of put it last. And then I talked about like the basic things I'm doing in each. So right? those defense, water. Community. I literally went from like it, it's like a, a reverse Maslow's hierarchy. So okay. the first thing is defense because if you can't keep what you have, you don't have it, right? right. Like if you got all this badass ranch and all these animals and you can't stop me from taking it, then I thought a lot about that. <laughs> then no, then I mean, seriously, like if I get overrun, what yes. was the point of having it in the first place? Dude, hundred percent, right? So you're hundred percent right. Defense is first, then water because like if, if okay, if I can defend my shit. The, the next thing I need to make sure I'm alive is water, right? Because you go about three days without water. Then food, you can go about three month, weeks without food, and then energy, right? Because you can actually go a long time without energy if you have your system set and, and right. Um, and, and then there's ways to build. And then community, I put community last just because, um, not because it's the least important, but because for most people coming from, a, we're not, not most Americans don't know anything about community. I, do, I thought I did. And then I got out on land, I realized I don't know shit about community. 
We do in six months on our, on our ranch have more community in a rural place than I've ever had anywhere living in a city. That's Not weird. counting companies that I've worked in or whatever, right? Like I've you're, had sitting, a you're sitting acres and acres and acres or tens of acres apart versus living in a city. I'm on 45. Uh, one side's 25, the other side's 40, this other side's like uh, 10, but then bordered by 200. We all know each other. Like, we all know each other. Yeah. We all, like, at least on one level, um, uh, are like in it together, right? Understand, okay, well, dude, I just got a flock of sheep. The motherfucker, those asshole sheep escaped three fucking times. Yeah. They're escape artists. It's the worst. <laughs> As I told you about my cows, right, too. Exactly. <laughs> and so, like, I got to know, I knew most of my neighbors, but then I got to know the neighbor's neighbors, right? Because, like, their fences weren't equipped for sheep. And so, like, got to know all of them. And Nat, like, bought an animal, tra- uh, you know, a, a trailer to go pick them up. And so, like, all my neighbors know I'm the dude with the trailer. If they ever want to borrow it, of course, I, owe the, I not only do I owe them a favor, but I'm happy to help, right? They help me. So as, as we go forward now, it's a, I have a, a, commu- a literal immediate physical community. We have a school that's very close to us, right? Then that's a community of, of over 100 families, right? And, and all of us are together. And like that community, we're building it from the ground up as an intent. We have a biodynamic farm there. It's a very intentional community. No one's living at the school, but the, like everyone there is like, I'm here because I want to be part of the community, not just schooling, right? right. We see ourselves as a group. And then I have other sort of a group of dudes that I train with, like defense stuff, right? That's another stuff. So there's layers of community in, in Dripping, where, which is, there was already tons of community out there, which I right. knew was pretty good. It's better than I thought. And so half the communities I'm just tapping into. Right. I don't have to create them. I just have to find a place where I, uh, uh, that I align politically. And Dripping is, they're all landowners. They're all fairly self-sufficient. They all believe in sovereignty. They're all Texans, right? In both the good and the bad ways. And so, uh, and all the, the transplants are people like me and you, who yeah. are like, we want the best parts of Texas, right? right? And so it's, it's an amazing community. So you have the, 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 the defense, but the, uh, defense of what? Food, water, energy. And um, self, family. And self, right. right. Um, and then you have the community, but the community really is what enables all of those things to work together. It really enables the defense mm-hmm. of those things. And yes. then, hey, I have extra water. Do you have extra food, right? And you of course, some of, of that. course, right. Like in, in a real supply chain emergency or in political emergency, which I don't think we're going to go into long extended ones, like anarchy situation, but I could definitely see situations where I mean, dude, if, if the U.S. dollar collapses, right, and that won't happen quickly, but it's slow, slow, slow all at once, we could have three to six months of extreme, like you think you've seen unstable supply chains, you don't fucking know what's yeah. coming, right? And so can, could, could the dripping community survive if six months of almost nothing coming in? Fuck yeah, we could. Yeah. Easily. Easily. Yeah. That community would make it. What do you think about, so the Doomer Optimism piece was the catalyst, which caused you to think about these things and go get them. But in that, you had talked about, you know, you had, you had talked to some special forces guys who had been deployed in other parts of the country, and they said, hey, this is what's happening, and we can tell you that this is the playbook that's being run here. Yeah. This could lead to supply chains breaking down. Yeah. We can't go more than a couple of days without food because the U.S. is too connected. Most people in cities, yeah, like three days at most. Three days. Yeah. So that's... Uh, that I mean, was, Pre, Pre-COVID, some people have, have wisened up, but even like people who have stores are, have like two weeks of food. Right. Right? You live in an apartment building in New York City. What do you do when the water's off? Yeah. What do you do when the power's off? Right? Yeah. Oh, or, or even if the water and power don't go off. If there's no food coming in, you got two weeks of food. First off, you're a target for everyone else in your building who doesn't have two weeks of food. But let's say you snuck a gun into New York right. illegally. Right. Okay, fine. So you, you're able to protect your food for two weeks. Cool, then what? You're dead. Yeah. No, I mean, like, what yeah. happens then is mass migrations out of the city. Yeah. Massive refugees. And we've situations. seen this happen with Hurricane Katrina. We, Literally. In, in New York, there was that hurricane that hit there and shut them down for a, Sandy. For a while. Yeah. yeah, Sandy. So mm-hmm. we've seen this happen. Yeah. I was, out, I was out to dinner. And those were situations where they were extremely geographically isolated. Right. What happens when they're not? What happens when they're regional or national? Right. So what happens in, what happens when the state of California defaults and there's a huge food emergency or this or that? Long term, California probably would be fine on its own, right? Food wise and whatever. Short term, there's 15 million people in LA. Yeah. 
Yeah. Where the fuck do they go? <laughs> and what do they eat? Yeah, my buddy, we were out to dinner last night, and he's like, you know, sometimes I think about, he's like, how many people do you think tonight, we'll, we're in the city, how many people will go out tonight and order a steak? Oh, yeah. Because Thousands. Like, he's like, I drive around, and I don't see any cows. They come from other places. And like, they how, come from Texas. How many and Nebraska. steaks are going to be ordered just tonight? Yeah. You know, and I've, I've been thinking about that for the last week. Yeah. And uh, that's yeah, a lot of steaks. You have cows on your land. No, I have cows on my and land. And I have cows on yeah. my land. No, so, but, but just when you think about that, you're like, wow, that's a lot of steaks in one single night. Where do they come from? Because I don't see any cows around. Sure, there's a couple here, a couple there. Yeah. But we're, we're talking thousands or tens yes. of thousands of steaks that yes. are needed. And you can start to see real quickly how fragile things could be. It's why Texas, why I picked Texas, man. Because like if things get not even really bad, just like let's say half as bad as they could get, right? Texas has its own ocean ports. It has its own energy. We are energy independent. We have our own grid. We have our own ports. We can easily produce more than enough food for ourselves. We're a, food, a net food exporter. We can manufacture enough of the things we need to, to, to be sustaining. Now, we can't have the exact quality of life we have now if, if, if we had to rely on ourselves, but, we, but the quality of life would not go down. Power would keep, you know, quality of life would not go down that much, right? But if you live in New York, you're fucked. Yeah. You're, you're lucky if you're able to be a refugee and walk out and find somewhere else to go, right? And you, actually, New York's not even that. They have ports, right? What do you do in Chicago? Yeah. What do you do in Minneapolis? What do you do in Portland? You know, you're probably fucked, right? Like, you're in real, real trouble. Yeah. And that's like... That's not, man, that's before you see true societal breakdowns. That's before you see mass anarchy. Or, you know, like, L.A. riots. Like, what, that's what happens when people... It happened people, in Ferguson. <laughs> like, right. It doesn't even have to happen in L.A. It, can it happen happened in, all of the summer yeah. of 2020. Yeah. Right? God, no, who knows what's going on now with the Roe v. Wade shit. There yeah. might be all kinds... Like, this stuff is... I'm telling you, man, it's like, it's... It, so much of it is avoidable, too. So much of it. Like... Well, you said first thing Biden does when he gets in is turn off all federal oil leases. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. Like that you that one thing changes a huge amount of this shifts overnight. Right? They've been saying, "Oh, but no, there's still plenty of land open. Oh, no, we didn't do anything. No, no we haven't turned anything off." They're and then last week he opened up a bunch of new leases again that admitted that what yeah. he had, that he had did it right but yeah. he's they, they did that secretly yeah. um, so there so maybe there's some some bright spots there so in the last year you spent a lot of time thinking about this obviously right. you spent a lot of time acting on it i'm sure you have your ear to the ground a little bit you're talking about a little bit of isolationist let me just take care of myself i'm sure you're paying attention to what's going on so i'm curious in the last 6 months uh, how much has progressed since you've kind of made that piece? So, for example, what is it? Biden came out and said there's going to be food shortages. Yeah. Like, I mean, when I wrote that piece, <laughs> it was December 28th, and when I published it, so many people, a bunch of people were like, thank you, like, this uh, crystallized what I've been thinking. But just as many people mocked me. Right. Two and a half months later, the president gets on TV and says there are going to be food shortages. And all those fucking people who were mocking me before are coming to me being like, hey, dude, can I come to your ranch if shit gets bad? I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> yeah. Go deal with your own shit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or they, uh, those people all went out and started flooding Costco and started stacking up on, uh, you know, rice or whatever the fuck. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. So we've seen this year 20 food processing plants blow up. Coincidentally... Uh, who knows? As alarming as that is, we have like 30,000 food processing right. plants. Yeah, so, so who what, knows? What's yeah. 20? In, yeah. And I, I would imagine they work with stuff that's flammable. I don't know. I, that, that is, that's one of those, it, I don't know. That's the weird thing about this. So that, that's actually a super, this is why I'm talking about we're in a mimetic war, right? That information out of context means nothing. Right. No, truly. Because like, do you know how many food processing plants burn down on average per year? That's I, why I, had I to, don't. That's why I had to look into it because I'm. Um, Did you? Uh, so I looked into how many food processing plants there are. Yes. I haven't been able to find that detail, but I realized it's such a small percentage of food processing plants. Right. It doesn't really matter. Right. So, but that, that's the other side. That's the the right side or the alarmist side right. using a piece of information to reinforce their frame. Another one is uh, Bill Gates became the largest landowner. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. far, farm farm landowner. Farm landowner. Yeah. China is also the largest farm land owner as well. Yeah. The alarmist side is like. I made a video talking about Bill Gates buying farmland. The alarmist side is like, oh my gosh, yeah. largest farm. Okay, how many acres does he own? 194,000. How many That's acres? It? How, yeah, 200,000. Uh, how many acres of farmland are there? 900 million. 
Okay. He only owns two hundred thousand. It's got to be more. I thought it was like two million. Uh, I believe it was two hundred thousand. I don't know. Dan, fact check that. I honestly don't know. Truly, I don't know. I believe it, but but to the point is like uh, this, the the alarmist side could yeah. play it up, right? Either yeah. side, yeah, and, right. And and having to dig through. Well, that. my funny thing is like, okay, the Chinese can buy the land they want here. What what are you gonna do with it? You gonna take it with you? Yeah. Like that, that's a whole part of it. What are the community like? Yeah. It's I guess they could lay, leave it lay fallow, but U.S. property laws can cover that. Like we can just fucking seize it, yeah. right? Like. I actually, we went through this in the 80s when the Japanese were doing great and their stock market was through the roof. They bought Rockefeller Center and all this shit and it's like, they can't take it with them. Yeah. What are they going to do? Yeah. You know, like that, I'm not, I'm not worried about that shit at all. Yeah. Like that's, that's nonsense. So you're worried about yourself, your family, your community. Mm -hmm. Focus on that. Yep. Spend, all, spend all time focusing on that. Um, which I, I kind of said is this isolationist type uh, Ron right. Paul kind of approach, right? Forget the world, like let's just focus on ourselves, which is not a bad approach. But isn't there factors that are outside of the world that could affect you? So we yeah, talked about course. earlier, like I said, the ostrich can bury its head in the sand, but it can still get eaten, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you're head down, just focused on you, your family, on your farm, are there factors outside that could that, that could affect that? If an asteroid hits the earth, I'm going to be affected, right? If if Russia uh, uh, nukes Ukraine or nu Ukraine nukes Russia, whatever the fuck, yeah, I mean. Or Russia nukes the U.S. Of course, like there are all kinds of things that are uh, uh, that could potentially impact me. Absolutely. Here's the question, though: What does me worrying about them do? Well, only if you could do something to protect yourself in that event. Oh, right. So that—that's what being sovereign is all about, right? Like, I'm not being sovereign. I'm not like, trying like, to... Like, like if, if there was a real threat of Russia sending nukes over here, right. I might go spend time in Central America for a little bit, potentially. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yes, okay, right. If I thought that was a high likelihood of probability, then leaving America would probably be... Right, then I, I, I would I mean, that's be, an example. Totally, 100%. Like, uh, so, uh, I, I'm all... I pay attention to what goes on in the world, but here's the thing, though. I don't pretend it's what's going on in the world. Okay. I pay attention to what different groups are trying to tell me about what's going on in the world because that tells me far more than what's actually going on. I don't know what's going on. The story on. or the narrative is more important than the facts. I don't want to say they're more important, but the, 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 the narrative usually gives you more information than the facts they present. Okay. So, for example, um, uh, when the, the war in the Ukraine or the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine started, right? Um, literally, every single corporate media station in America, I think even including Fox News, all immediately coalesced in a line behind one opinion, one set of heroes, one set of facts, one opinion goes to Kiev, which we now know is completely made up. Right. The, 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 whatever, 12 soldiers on that whatever island. that island yeah. totally made, uh, they didn't die, right? Yeah. Every fucking story was made up. But what they all coalesced behind one story. When has that ever happened with the truth? Yeah, probably never. The only thing I knew about the Ukraine coverage was that it was bullshit. Right, I, I, no, which does not mean the opposite is true. Just because the U, uh, U.S. corporate media is making Zelensky a hero and the UK, Ukrainians the good guys, does not mean Putin is the. Uh, uh, the it means they're wrong. Doesn't mean Putin's a good guy. Bad guys can fight bad guys, right? right. <laughs> like, yeah. but you can have sh criminals robbing criminals, yeah. right, or whatever. Yeah. So it's not the opposite of what they say is not necessarily. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. But all, the only thing I knew for sure is that this is bullshit. Right? There might be a war going on. There might be actual underlying facts, but their frame is always bullshit. Always. And it's always there to serve an end of theirs, which is usually never serving an end of mine. Yeah. Those are the only two things I knew. So that's why paying attention helps. Is like, oh, their focus over here, what, can, what do I know from that? I know, I know what, what they're saying is bullshit, so Zelensky's not a good guy. He might, he might be better than Putin, but he's, we know he's not a good guy. We know that 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 uh, that this is at least more complicated than they're saying. Yeah. Uh, and also, I knew enough about the color revolution CIA over there to knew like this is bullshit. Like they're yeah. saying. But uh, and then I also know they're trying to distract me. Yeah. Like they're trying to get me to pay attention to something that serves their ends. And then this is probably gonna. There's probably some other play from this. There's probably all of that combined. All <laughs> of it combined. And then there's another play. Like they they maybe. 
I don't know what the other play is. You know, like you were saying, I, I don't know if this was on camera or not. We we're talking about like uh, when Putin gave the speech about uh, Russian sovereignty yeah, to the cameras, yeah, yeah, right. And so maybe they're trying to get Putin out. Maybe they're using this as a way to launder all Biden's crimes and money. Maybe they're using this as a way to de- entrench the deep state. Maybe it's something else. I don't fucking know. I have no fucking like all the stuff about the bio labs that came from the other side doesn't look like that's all that true, right? I don't know, but I don't know if any of that's true. I just know the narrative is information that I can use to, to, to factor off of them, but it almost never results in actions I need to take. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, now, but the Doomer Optimism piece, I wrote about how looking at the narrative over time, I was able to see, oh, they're coming. Like, they're coming to take all of, as much of, as, uh, of, of myself as they can take. Of course, the right. WF told you that. <laughs> they did. They were, that's the best part. It is so. Bo- that dude is such. I have no idea how much power he, uh, Klaus Schwab, actually has, and I have no idea how relevant the World Economic Forum really is to what's going on. They might actually be the bad guy, or they might just be a bunch of clowns dancing on the side stage. It don't matter. Right. But it is crazy how much he actually looks and acts like a Bond villain. Yeah. It's like. Yeah. It's like it, if I wrote a movie about this 10 years ago, people would be like, dude, you can't write a Bond villain as the villain. This, no one's going to believe right. that the Bond villain in real life is a, it just acts like a Bond villain. Right. Yeah, I know. And that's the best part is the books are all like yeah. exactly what... Uh, he's just telling everyone what he's doing. Yeah. Like, uh, that's always, isn't that always the part you watch James Bond movies? You're like, no villain would actually tell the dude. Just kill him, right? Right, 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 yeah. Well, I, I, maybe that is actually how it works. <laughs> Back to the World Economic Forum, um, Klaus Schwab studied under Henry Kissinger. Yes. And Henry Kissinger said uh, he controls the oh, food, the controls worst. the people, controls boy. the energy, controls the continent, controls the money, controls the world. Totally. And so it's, uh, uh, it's not a surprise, back to telling you what their playbook is, that those are the three attack vectors yes. that we see, yes. right? Food, energy, money. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I would say he's probably pretty influential. I mean, the most influential people in the world go there and attend mm. the Davos True. meeting and whatnot. True. Um, what's interesting, though, and, and I guess, I guess so. What you're saying, though, is that, um, and I guess it's something I've tried to do as well. Like, know enough about something that know enough that you need to know, but you don't need to know any more than that. Right. Like, I know who Klaus Schwab is. I know uh, what uh, enough about the World Economic Forum. I'm not going to spend any time trying to figure out how relevant they are to what's going on. Right. Because it doesn't actually matter. All that matters is I see the trend. Like, okay. I, I, I'm one of those people, I don't generally need to see a whole lot to usually know what's going on. If it's an area I pay attention, right. I can, I'm pretty good at, at thin slicing and getting like, oh shit, this is the trend. Like in the areas I pay attention to, right. not everything, right? But like, I, uh, and so this became, although there were a lot of people who saw this trend way before me, like uh, once I realized, oh, we've kind of passed that point, then it's like, I don't need to see more evidence. You know, a lot of people, that's the problem with, with making an information war, a factual war, like when people want to argue some point with me, I always ask them, the first question I ask is, tell me what facts would change your mind. I'm not saying they exist and I'm not saying I have them. Right. But before we go into a discussion about this topic, tell me what would change your mind. And like, I, like, like if I said, the dollar's gonna crash. Right. And you're like, okay, well, what, what, what would you have to see you that could, would... Right, you could probably tell me scenarios where you would stop believing the dollar would crash. Right. Right? And that's, that, that is the number one test for me to understand whether someone is a, a free thinker or just uh, like taking assigned opinions, right? Yeah. If they can't tell you what would change their mind, they didn't think their way into this, right? They're just, they're just uh, regurgitating opinions that were assigned to them by their screen or by yeah. their group. Yeah, they right. haven't thought about them from a first principles level where they could make their own decisions based exactly. off of that. Exactly. I see so many people that uh, everything is uh, everything's linear. It's either right. black or white or yes or no. Yeah. It's like Bitcoin's going to fail. It's going to zero. A hundred percent? A hundred percent. There's no other way, right? Or, or whatever yeah. it is, is yeah. right? Or the dollar's going to fail. Like, yeah. okay. Like, and there's no nuance yeah, to no. anything. Yeah. And so back to that, that kind of yeah. free thinker. So um, let's go back to... Uh, I call it the war on information, right. mimic war, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Uh, isolationist. Let me focus all my energy on protecting myself, my family, my community. Right. Um, strengthen that up. But you have kids. Kids have changed. My kids are older than yours, but it's changed my world view. Yeah, totally. Because I start to think about. We were at dinner during the whole COVID pandemic uh, yeah. in California. It got crazy, right? Like it was it was insane. Yeah. 
And uh, my daughter, we're at the kitchen table eating, and she says, at least we can go outside now. And I was like, did my daughter just say at least we can go? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, the world I grew up in, we could do whatever we wanted. And she's saying that this is the world that she knows at least we're allowed to go outside. Oh. And it really was like just like this punch in the gut. And I, I've, I've thought a lot since then, like what kind of world is my, are my kids going to yeah. have? Yeah. And so then what can I do to make sure my kids have a better world? Yeah. And of course, having the ranch here where I can make sure they're okay. Yeah. If, if supply chains break down, yeah, sure. Of course, of course. And they get the right education, sure, yeah. okay. Yeah. But like, what about the world they're gonna inher inherit? Yeah. And of course, I can't change the world, uh, but I could maybe try to have influence over the world. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why I put out so much content. You maybe, can change your world though. I can change my world and maybe I could uh, inspire, you inspired yeah. me mm -hmm. to, to get a ranch. So maybe I can inspire people, educate yeah. people, yeah. motivate totally. people. That changes your world. I'm with you, totally. Right. But it, it changes my kids' world, yes. the, the, the world my kids will have. Yes. So for me, I feel, I don't want to say a responsibility, but I feel like maybe I'm doing my part to make sure my kids and grandkids have a free world they can live in mm -hmm. by educating, inspiring, so not controlling, but influencing. The way, I, I, I totally get your point. The way I look at it is, um, my kids are gonna have their own battles and struggles in their life. Their life is theirs. It's not mine, right? And it's not up to me to make their life easier or harder. Uh, I, I want, I'm gonna, there's really only two things I'm gonna try and do. I'm gonna love them as much as I can, unconditionally, right? And then um, I wanna try and help them uh, learn as much as they want about the world and figure out their place in the world, but it's ultimately their decision, right? And it's their, their path not mine, right? And so like, which doesn't mean I don't care. Of course I care. But the world but is the frame that they're gonna have to have that path in. And the, that the battles that they're gonna have to fight are gonna be their own. You wanna equip them to fight those battles, but the battles are gonna be with the world around them. So for example, you put that post up the other day, Saturday morning right. about the school. Yeah. You got hundreds of people saying, hey, I wanna start a school. Yeah. If, if uh, more people, thousands of people around the country started setting up schools like that and uh, more people started doing it and kids started learning the right way, would that be lead to a better world for your kids or a worse world? Better, um, right? Yeah, like on net better, but like I'm not sure how much that would directly impact them. It's, it's not like, okay, so it's not, I don't discount the ripple impacts, right? They right. might be huge, uh, but like, that's way beyond, that's beyond my control. And it's beyond my... It's um, beyond your control, but not beyond your influence. You've influenced hundreds of people yeah, in, one, I mean, in one post. I, I don't discount that. That's right. You're, you're absolutely correct about that. But that... The way... This is really... It's just, it's just my... The way I look at this is... Um, to me, what matters the most is... You know, honestly, it all started like a couple years ago. I basically, someone uh, asked me something. And I think it was something about imagining my deathbed was the question. And, and I actually did the exercise and I really sat and thought about like. You write your eulogy or whatever. No, 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 no. Okay. wasn't that, uh, obituary. It's not that, it was, I literally imagined myself dying, who was gonna be there? Right, and and, uh, and why would they be there? Right, and so I obviously wanted my wife there. Like I'm ten years older than her, so I'm probably out liver. I wanted my kids there, my grandkids, and then maybe a couple of core friends. Right, and, and yeah, like my uh, you know my funeral might have hundreds or thousands of people. That's cool, right? Uh, but like at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters to me that that exercise really got me to realize for me. The only thing that matters is the work I do, or the relationships I have with the people I love, and the work I do that impacts them. And I, yeah, I mean, like if I do work that impacts them that also impacts tons of other people, that's awesome, right? Like I'm super happy you got that ranch, and I'm super happy like you're gonna establish this legacy for your daughter and teach her how to be sovereign, and she's gonna be in a better situation and grow up in a better world. That's awesome, right? But like. Uh, probably you're not gonna be in my deathbed, and vice versa, right? Which doesn't mean we can't be friends and influence each other and be awesome, like, 
I'm glad you exist, right? right? But like the the core stuff in my life, it's one of the, it, that exercise made me realize how overwhelmingly important that is. It's not a little bit more important than the next couple circle rings out. It's a hundred times more important. It's a you know, and so like that's where I focus now. Not that everything else doesn't matter. It matters, right? But I'll give you a really good example. Let's say, let's just, just an exercise. I'm not saying, let's just pretend that I come up with some amazing uh, uh, ways to frame the world and ideas and I become the fucking Jesus, Gandhi, Buddha, Mandela of this time. And, and I, I, I guide America through this with my ideas and my words and wisdom. And we come out the other side and it's like, it's a true doomer optimism situation. Like shit got really bad, but now everything's way better, right? That's all, like, I'm, like I'm, okay, probably not gonna happen, but it's not unthinkable, right? Okay, so if I do that, but the price of that is I was a horrible husband and a shitty father and my kids are broken and fucked up and traumatized, I'm not making that you trade. Failed. I'm yeah. not making that trade. I'm just not, and not even I failed. I'm just saying I'm not making that trade, right? right. And so uh, and other people might decide otherwise and okay, then that's, that's their, Elon Musk. I know Elon's ex-wife really well. I know his family situation somewhat, better than most people. He has made the other decision. Like he is all in on you know, Tesla and energy and Mars and everything else. And I'm not gonna say he doesn't care about his kids, but he is not in any way, shape or form the father I would be right, right. He's made a different choice, and like, I mean, shit. I think a lot of stuff Elon does is cool, yeah. man. Like, I'm not trying to shit on Elon. I'm just saying I, that is not a choice I would ever make. And so, like, I don't disagree with you. I just don't. I don't weigh or consider that because dude, you know. And also, man, I've been the other side. Like, my first career when I was writing all the books about drinking, hooking up. Like, I was fucking. First, I had a period there where I was super famous and all the stupid shows and all. And I realized how meaningless that was to me. Right. And so it's like... Okay, so if, uh, so if you're isolationist, you wanna care about yourself, your kids, your family, et cetera, um, and you don't really care so much, then why are you doing the podcast now to put all that information right, out there? Right, so uh, I would not call myself an isolationist. I get your point though. I, my focus is, is internal and community, right? Okay, so um, the... Uh, this is gonna sound a little pretentious, but I mean this in the, the least pretentious way possible. The, the Buddha said that the, the point of life is to do your work and then share it with others so that it might help them do theirs, right? And so I 100% believe that. Like my primary goal is to do my work and to help my family, but um, that's not the only point of life, right? And so, uh, and my community. But once I, I'm at a fairly stable place there, which I am, not, not perfect, but stable, um, there are a lot of other people who um, want to advance themselves and learn more and do their work. And uh, though I am not perfect, I am, you know, on the, the long road of, of doing your work, I, I, I don't know where I am, but there are a lot of people behind me that would love to learn from me. Just like there are a few people ahead of me that I'm like, man, I want to learn from this dude right. or that, that woman. And so I'm happy to share that stuff. Um, uh, if it helps people, like, on it, it's not. It's so funny, man. So much of the stuff that like I talk about, I, I've been in media so long. I, I know this is how it goes, but there's still a shock to me when like I show a random picture of a school, and I'm like, you can do this too, and then like hundreds and thousands of people are like coming at me for help, and I'm like, guys, this is not that hard. Go on to like, Google, go on to Google. <laughs> <laughs> like it's not that hard to do this. Yeah. But maybe it's not about the information. You know, maybe it's a lot of it's about the example, right? And that's, so that, that, that's exactly what it is. If you can be an example, if I can be an example, then I'll be an example, right? And I'll share your example. Like people are like, how do I do Bitcoin? I'm like, go talk to Mark. Like yeah. he did this, right? So I guess that's that was my question. So it's like um, influence the world around us for the better. I feel like if I could, to, to, the, to the point I made, if, if more people could start these schools, right. more people could start farming, if more people could do this, like more people could wake up to what's going on with the government, 100%. Then, then the world will change for the better and the world my kids will have will be better. 100%. And yes. so it all goes together. Yes. Right? I, no, I agree. I, I just don't, the only difference probably, uh, I don't focus as much on what the impacts might be 
because I'm going to do this regardless of the extended impacts, right? If they exist, that's awesome, and I'll take them, and I'm happy for it. That's not why I'm doing it. Got it. You know? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, we always have to know our why. Yes. If we don't know our why, then the why nots pile up. So for me, I guess I'm trying to make a bigger impact, but there's, it's uh, pretty hard to gauge that specifically, I guess. I just have to feel like the work that I'm doing is doing good. But at the end of the day, I guess either way, it's hopefully impacting people positively to become more sovereign. Yeah. And if more people can become sovereign, I think the world becomes a better place. For all of us. Yeah, for yep. all of us, right? There's no reason to argue about uh, a bunch of bullshit. About it. Why argue about sending people to Ukraine if we're all just worried about our own stuff? Yeah. U Ukrainians can worry about their stuff, and the Russians can worry about their stuff, and we'll worry about our stuff. We're going to leave each other alone. Yeah. Pretty good idea. The I only people who win when we argue about this are... Parasite globalists. Yeah, yeah. I guess one thing I would say, you had made a comment earlier about dialing back down the information. So like what- You mean the intake? For the me. intake of yes, information, totally. right? Yeah. So I think we used to have a problem with getting good information, and today yeah. how do we discern or cut through that information yes. that we have? So what are some practical tips that you could give to figure out very quickly what you need to, you know, either pay attention to or or uh, shut down. How do you think through that? Um, I'm going to give it an unusual answer to this because let me tell you a story. So my mother-in-law, right? Uh, my wife's mom. Uh, you know, like there's the trope about all oh, mother-in-laws are horrible. I love my mother-in-law. We get along great. They're, I get along with my wife's mom better than she does. Like she and, and her mom fight a lot. Anyway, so um, when I first met my we've been together like 10 years. When I first met my wife, my mother-in-law was one of those people who would uh, like post uh, uh, memes on Facebook or whatever. They were all very borderline QAnon, but very sort of pro-Trump, Fox News style stuff, right? Okay. And the entire way she viewed the world was through that lens. Even though she was a very sweet, wonderful woman, like, but that was definitely like, like her lens. And then um, I did a bunch of, um, you know, I, I've always been doing therapy and emotional work and trying to get, you know, raise my levels of consciousness and all that. And then about four years ago, I discovered psychedelic medicine. I really went deep in that rabbit hole. And it's been totally transformative and amazing for me. She saw the change in me. And she decided she wanted to do MDMA therapy. Which my mother-in-law. Yeah, my mother-in-law. And this is like a 65-year-old country woman from Tennessee, right? Which never in a million years would I have guessed this was going to happen, but she did. Yeah. And, and the work was totally transformative for her. And w without going too deep in her story, like all kinds of shit came up. And it was rough for her, but she kept doing the work. And uh, When you say doing the work, is that like done with a therapist? So it's oh, like, yeah, yeah. You're not just doing Molly out in your yard. <laughs> At the nightclub. Yeah, no, no, no. no That's no, not no. the therapy you're no, talking no, no. about. I, like, it, I talk about this on my blog. I have a, a, like a few pieces on this. I'm about to finish like the beginner's guide to psychedelic medicine to help new people who are coming into this world because it's a very unusual world. But basically, yeah, you find... It's not legal yet, uh, MDMA therapy, but there's, it's in state street clinical trials. It's probably gonna be legal next year. There, it, there's a bunch of public companies who are already developing these compounds that, that they can't sell yet, but they will be able to soon. But uh, there's a, a whole network of underground guides that like, I'm plugged into. This is like the ayahuasca guides or totally. like whatever. Totally, same thing, right? The difference is most people pouring ayahuasca in America are frauds and should not be doing it and they're dangerous. The, the good ones are not, they're amazing. But most, MDMA is very different. MDMA is a very, it's a synthetic compound, it's very stable, it's very safe, and you can be a good guy, a very good guide with, you know, two, three years of training. Ayahuasca is like six, seven, eight, ten years of training, oh, really? at least, and it, usually in the jungle, right? So that's what's, like, I is dangerous, but, um, yeah, so I'm very plugged into that guide network. I kind of, she plugged her into the same network, and she got, um, but it, the point is, as she did more of her emotional work, like all, felt all of her stuff from childhood and trauma and dealt with it, she stopped, not only did she stop posting all these nonsense memes, right? But like, she stopped caring about it. She stopped paying attention to it, wow. right? Because that, that was a substitute for her, for finding meaning in her life. It was a way to escape a lot of difficult stuff. When she turned to face it and dealt with it, she didn't need that anymore. And now, she, she was already a good woman, now she's like this happy, joyous person. She, she spends all of her time, three things, and this is it, with her grandchildren, my kids, and she's such an amazing grandmother, uh, gardening, 
or she actually trained to be an MDMA guide and now has just started on that journey. Wow. No bullshit, right? And so like, she's helping others. Her whole life is these three things. And, and so like, th- your question was, a good one, what you know, tactics or, or you know, whatever do you use to, to know which information to pay attention to or not? I would actually go the other way. I would frame the answer from, or I frame the answer from the position of, figure out what matters to you, right? And how, whatever path you need to take there. Like, you don't have to go do Molly, but like if, if doing the work means that for you, do it. But if not, that's fine. What matters to you and focus on that, and I think you'll naturally figure out what actually matters and what doesn't. You know, and what you need to pay attention to and what you don't. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. And that's actually the best answer that most people have never actually taken the time to think through. What is it that I want? What matters to me? There's a saying I'm sure you've heard. It's like, uh, either you go build the life of your dreams or someone else will hire you to build theirs, yeah. right? Yeah. And so it's like, what is it that you're trying to do? Um, it's something that I spent, I spent about a decade in personal development yeah. stuff. Goal setting books yeah. and what are your values yeah. and all that stuff. Um, I had always, uh, most good, good goal setting books start with what are your core values? And mm-hmm. I'd always like skip over that, ah, skip that, like I wanna get to the goal setting book. And it took me years before I realized, well, if I don't set my values, I don't know what to you set don't, my You don't know what goals are. You don't know what the goals are, right? Mm-hmm. So it kind of goes back to that. So then it's like, okay, let me do me. I, I have a daughter that's graduating high school, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm very extreme. I actually don't want my daughter to go to college. I, I, I'm I, sure I you totally, would agree with that. 100%. But in uh, her, Is she? I I've been I've been I've tried to be very careful. Like I want to influence my kids, right. obviously. Of course. But I don't want to tell them what they have to do. I agree. Obviously, when they're little kids, you kind of have to, right? Well, I'm with you. So I kind of wanted her to like make up her own mind. She knows where I stand on it, but I didn't ever want to tell her you can't yeah, go. Yeah, of course. Um, but I didn't ever tell her that I want her to go either. Yeah. I've just kind of like left it open, and yeah. she knows where I stand on it, but I've never put that on her. Good. And about, I don't know, six, eight months ago, she started saying, I want to go to college. And I was just- Because her friends are going. All her friends are going. Yeah. We're gonna to go to this one, we're gonna to go to this yeah. one, we're gonna join this sorority, it sounds yeah. like a big party. Yeah. And I was just silent. Yeah. And I didn't say, you should, let me do it for you. I didn't say you shouldn't. And then, um, I don't know, six months ago, I took her out to dinner and yeah. I said, look, you kinda of know where I stand on this issue. Right. I said, um, if you really wanna to go to college and you go sit down with the people and you fill out the forms and you get accepted and you need my help, I'm your dad. Right. I'm, I'm gonna help you, yeah. no matter what. Yeah. But I said, it's on you. So yeah. you got to take the lead. Good. And I never heard anything else about college after that point. So uh, I, I have other friends whose kids did 100% of the work. Yeah, and they're yeah. like, I can't believe my kid did all this. Yeah. My kid was kind of the opposite. She's like, okay, I guess I'm yeah. not going, right? Yeah. Um, now she said, like, oh, all my friends are going to go get this four-year paid vacation. Uh, and I'm like, that's, that's what you think? Uh. But um, my point is, is she's at this inflection point yeah. where... <clears throat> she's faced with becoming an adult and all her friends are going to this next stage of life and she doesn't know what she's going to do. And uh, I said, look, I said, I get how scary that is for you because your whole life has been laid out for you Mm -hmm. and now it's up to you. I said, but it's also good because now you can go make it whatever you want. Yep, you can go try a ton of things. But you got to sit down and figure out what is it that you want. Yes. Because if you don't, you're just going to be this meandering ship without a sail. Someone else will enroll you in their vision. This proverbial you don't come thing. Up with your own. Um, so I'm curious. Uh, so I loved your answer, by the way. Um, if I know where I'm going, and, and, and that's what I tell her, you know, it, it's just no different than time management or, or money management. Right. You either wonder where all your money went, or you make a plan for it ahead of time where it's going to go, yeah. kind of a thing, right? Um, you wonder where your life went, or you make a plan for it. I'm curious uh, in this whole uh, psychedelic therapy, whatever. Do you think that's very beneficial in helping people figure that out? If they're ready to do it. Like, I never tell people they should do psychedelic therapy. I never once told anyone they should do it. I know it's not how I talk about it. All I do is I, I talk about my experiences or the things that I've seen. I talk about how the medicine works. I talk about uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there are some people out there who are advocating for it. I, you're not going to hear me use this word often. I think they're wrong. I think it's absolutely wrong to advocate for it. It'd be, it's not really fundamentally different than being like, Mark, you have to go eat some ice cream now. You really got to. Right. Well, I don't want to eat ice cream. No, but you should. 
And the vanilla, you gotta have the vanilla, right? Yeah, but there's so, there's no perceived benefit. Where like with with psychedelic treatment, I've heard of people getting cured from PTSD in one treatment. So let's say that no, you, that's absolutely ha it happens all the time. So if you're someone that was suffering from PTSD and then maybe you've tried a bunch of different things, yeah, no, no, no. But no? it's a very different thing to say this substance approached with the this medicine approached with the right intention and the right. Uh, in the right situation might be able to help you versus you have to do this. Sure, sure, okay. So yeah. those are fundamentally different energies. Uh, I'll tell you why, man, because MDMA therapy is no joke. Like that's the easiest, so that's would the you, starting would you, would you put that together with psilocybin as well or you break They're those? different, they're very okay. different. So, so uh, MDMA is not technically a psychedelic, right? So uh, psychedelics, you know, are, are tryptamine derivative, molecular compounds, MDMA is, is a, Methyl, methyl dioxide, methamphetamine, it's a whole different molecular compound. It works very differently. Just like ketamine is kind of its own thing. Whereas uh, mushrooms, LSD, all the DMT derivatives, peyote, those are all very, very similar compounds, right? Uh, uh, I, th they call them all psychedelics just to make it easy. MDMA is the place most people, is the best place for most people to start because MDMA is very gentle. It's very soft. It, you, you're not... Like you take LSD, you're going on a 12 hour ride whether you want to or not, it's, you're in. MDMA is not really like that. Like you, you can take it and you can modulate the effects to a lot of degrees, right? It's why people can take a bunch of it and go to clubs and dance and do right. stuff, right? Um, so uh, it, it is, I tell people what it's like and what my experience was and how beneficial it was for me. But also I tell people, listen, things usually get harder before they get easier. Like this is not a casual, don't do, it's not a thing to do casually. It is a thing to do when you, if you are suffering and you have trauma and you have issues and you've tried a lot of other things and they haven't worked, it might be a place to look, right? right? It might be a place to examine. But I mean, I've, for every hundred people who are, pro first of all, I don't never recommend it to people, but of, the, of, the, of every hundred people who come to me asking because about it. Because you've talked about it openly. Right, which I do. I'm happy to talk about it with people. Maybe, maybe 20 ask for a referral to a guide, which I'll give, like even your audience, if they wanna uh, email me uh, and ask for a referral to a guide, I'll send them a, like I know two guides who will take blind referrals, right? I'll send them a guide referral, right? Of those 20, maybe five will actually end up going through with the, the stuff. Now, of those five. You don't know my audience, but <laughs> I'm kidding. Right. But of, of those five, man, like usually their lives are fundamentally changed, whatever, yeah. but man, one out of every 10, like uh, one out of every, 20, it, it can be like, or more, it can be, almost all of them, it's really challenging at the beginning. Because in short, what psychedelic medicine does is it brings up all the emotions you've been hiding from or pushing down or pushing away. Whatever you're afraid of, afraid of whatever you're ashamed of, whatever stuff you don't want to face, the goal of it is to bring it up. And so like, that's, that's hard, that sucks, dude, that's not fun. Yeah. And the other side of it is liberating and all kinds of growth and it's amazing, but man, going through it is, dude, I, there have been times on medicine, I was feeling so much grief, I thought I was gonna die. Wow. Right, so it's like, it's not a casual thing. But, um, sh it, and there, man, there are some people, man, who aren't ready, they, they do it because they think they're supposed to. They aren't ready to face their stuff and it ends up making, their life a lot harder. And they wow. double back down on the things that they were using to hide from their emotions, whether it's success or money or sex or drugs or whatever, right? right. And so like it can be very dis destabilizing. So I, I never, I, I, like I know Aubrey real well, Aubrey Marcus, I love the dude. He doesn't do this as much recently, but early on a few years ago, he would talk about ayahuasca, like it's just this amazing thing, everyone should do it. No, you shouldn't. I is no joke, man. Yeah. I will fuck your shit up if you are not ready for it, you know? And even if you are ready for it, it fucks you up. And I, like, I didn't do that for two and a half years into my journey. And even then, it still fucked me up. But I was ready, I knew how to handle it. Okay, man, I know people who started with Aya who are like famous people, who are like, dude, I almost didn't make it. Now, yeah. maybe that's the path they had to take, et cetera. But it is, I know, it is, do not, it is not a place to go in casually. Yeah. You know, I love it. I love psychedelic medicine I, as a tool. But I love it the way, like, you you know construction really well. You probably love hammers, but not like, you don't know, sleep with hammers, you right. worship hammers. Hammers Hammer just a tool. Hammer me all the right. time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a super important tool to build a house. Yeah. But it's just a tool. Yeah, yeah. Same with psychedelics. Yeah. They're just tools. So I'm guessing, I already know the answer, but as a self-sovereign individual or trying to become or, or working towards being more of one or whatever, um, 
I know there's a battle going on to try to legalize them. They used to be legal not that long ago. Yeah, I, know, I know. And now they're illegal, yeah. but I know like states like Oregon are really mm -hmm. pioneering Pushing that. Yeah. I'm guessing you're an advocate for that. I mean, it should, yeah, of course. I, I mean, like, I mean, uh, probably decriminalize all drugs. I would imagine. I, I will tell you, in my experience, for me, nothing has been more sovereignty-inducing than psychedelics. MDMA really is about healing trauma. That's yeah. it, and it's it's like a, a sniper rifle. It does one thing. It does it great. Mushrooms and LSD and the other medicines um, will help you with trauma. But that's almost like a side effect in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's usually not the, the primary thing. What psychedelic, traditional psychedelics, psilocybin, LSD, et cetera, G DMT, they essentially strip the veneer off of reality and help you see more of what's going on, Yeah. right? And it's one of those things, man, I don't like to talk about it with people, uh, with a broad audience or people who don't, who haven't done it because it sounds fucking crazy. Yeah. Everything about psychedelics if you haven't done psychedelics, sounds like complete fucking nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, five years ago, because I had never done any drugs recreationally, ever. Only drink. And so, like, I thought everyone talking about LSD and all that, I thought they were all fucking just fruitcakes. Or they just, just, what? And then I did it, I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, some of them are fruitcakes. But now I understand what they're talking about. Yeah. Now I get it. Yeah. And so, like, um, f helping me really become truly sovereign Psychedelics have been a massive part of that because what they do is help me understand that everything I need is within, that uh, I don't, all of this stuff is an artificial construction, right? Not, this desk exists, you exist, but like, my favorite example of this is like the Oscars, right? The award ceremony for movies. If you don't pay attention to the Oscars, like I wouldn't have known they were going on this year except for Will Smith yeah. beat up Chris Rock, right? But like, if you don't pay attention to them, they don't exist. Yeah. But like, if you're in Hollywood, they're like this huge thing. Yeah. What psychedelics show you is almost everything in the human world is like the Oscars. Yeah. That like, if you want to pay attention to it, it exists and it can be super real. But that almost everything is made up, and that you can yeah. can you can impact your reality to levels you can't fly like a bird or what. Yeah. But like, you can impact reality in ways that most people don't yeah. understand. No, it's a good story. I mean, it's a good analogy because it's exactly what you're talking about, which is like, I don't need to pay attention to all that stuff. Right. I remember we were in Puerto Rico last year, and my kids haven't been going to school. Right. This whole, you know, we're, we're detached. We're living on an island, yeah. and, you know, we're done with all that. And uh, we don't have a TV, right. you know, but like, we're at, we're at a restaurant, and it was mainstream news, I don't know, CNN yeah. or whatever it was yeah. on TV. And it was just like story after story. And I, like we're watching this while we're eating. And it was like they're talking about the school district. And they're talking about this and that. And I'm just like, I don't know. Whatever that is, like we're not part of any of that. And I, I don't want, any, I don't want about, anything dude. to do with that. Yes. You know? And uh, yes. I felt so detached from what was going on in, in a positive way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point. So, uh, yeah, and I don't, I, don't, I don't care about that. So, uh, man, we've covered a lot of ground. Yes. Uh, I think we've, we've covered enough for now. Uh, maybe... In a year from now, when I'm more sort of self-sovereign, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out. We'll, uh, you're on we'll the talk path, man. You're, you're on the you're, path. Yeah. Your shit's good, man. We right. walked it. It's nice. Yeah. It's not so, doing bad. Uh, do you want to point people to a podcast that's coming Tucker out Max. soon? TuckerMax.com. Just go to my website com. if you want to find stuff. Everything's there. Cool. Yep. All right. That's it. Cool, Thanks. man.